Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing. Cool. This is such a troll move. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many rhythm games, particularly at the end of a very long stage, will bring in one final note at the very end to try and fake you out and ruin your perfect score. Um, the next song we're going to listen to is actually does the exact same thing. Or at least the game does.
This this song might be difficult to pin down. What game this is from? Ish, can you get it? Let's see if you can get this one.
Okay, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me okay? Let me turn my voice down a little bit. Can you hear me okay? Chat? We will go ahead and get started if so. We have a lot to cover today. We've got some breaking news. Um, if you haven't seen this yet this morning, Microsoft is set to buy ZeniMax Media, uh, which means that they will own Bethesda. Uh, they, which means they'll own everything that Bethesda owns, which includes the Fallout franchise, which includes Skyrim, uh, which includes uh, ID software, which which includes because they own Doom uh, and uh, Rage and some of the other fran Wolfen Wolfenstein. They'll own ID Tech. They'll own the Creation Engine, what Bethesda uses, uh, and so it's it's a shocking development for sure. Um, Though not entirely surprising, uh, Microsoft has had some trouble as of late. So this morning, Microsoft purchases Bethesda. They're getting, a, no, sorry, this is not million. This is a B, billion, I believe. Uh, is that right? <clears throat> 7.5 bill. Yep, that's right. Um, so Microsoft will now own ID Software, Arcane, Elder Scrolls, Fallout. Um, it looks like uh, my first reaction was that this is a response to Halo Infinite kind of missing the launch of the new console that Microsoft is putting out uh, very soon, the next couple months. But they actually have no big games coming out then, so that's that can't be the case. Um, another reason they may have done this would be to deprive Sony and Nintendo, their two big first-party platform rivals, of you know two of the biggest, most impactful single-player RPG series in the in the world, right? Um, you will not, going into the future, very good odds, you will not be able to buy Fallout. You will not be able to buy the next Elder Scrolls game uh, if you uh, are on uh, the Sony console, right? If you decide to make that your one and only platform. So it's a very interesting situation. Um, you, and, and one thing that's also very interesting is that Microsoft now owns both Obsidian, you know, one of the original creators of Fallout, the creator of Fallout New Vegas, um, and uh, creator of many RPG series, The Outer Worlds, um, and Bethesda. They're under the same house. So Microsoft now has a big, big control of the Western RPG genre right now. Um, so what can you expect? Well, I mean, Sony is probably going to be thinking to themselves, we need to get some, some single-player RPG action going on our console. Um, which is, you know, maybe they will lean he more heavily on Demon Souls, which is maybe their biggest single-player RPG franchise that they own and control. Um, and they also, Sony has control partially of the Final Fantasy series, at least on, on console. So um, they will not be entirely without RPG games on their platform. But you might see them start to ramp up the investment they're making in that genre pretty soon as a result of this. Um, because a lot of people, there are a lot of big fans of Elder Scrolls and big fans of Fallout who will buy an entire console specifically and only for those games. Um, so it's, uh, it's a pretty big deal. It's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. Um, so let's keep going. Uh, I want to show you some fun things. Uh, this is some subtle but impressive Sheep AI. Uh, this is a game, I believe, um, from the uh, Forza Horizons game. Uh, where you can actually, it's an open world driving game. It's an open world driving game, uh, and uh, it, it features the sheep AI, right? The sheep AI is very interesting. No matter how hard you try, you will never be able to hit them, okay? You will never ever be able to hit a sheep in this game. Um, and that's because the closer you get to a sheep, the faster it runs, to the point where just before you're able to hit the sheep, the sheep actually takes its velocity vector, points it away from you, and then gives the sheep the velocity of your car as you get closer to it. Um, if you think about the reason that um, a developer might choose to do this, right? Okay, we want sheep, we want them to be, you know, realistic, but we don't want to have to model what happens if you actually can hit the sheep, okay? You know, we don't want the car to just go through the sheep, and clip through. That's very cheap looking. We also don't want the car to be able to hit the sheep. Because if we can hit the sheep, then we have to make the sheep ragdoll. And, it, and we might have to create a gib system. So the sheep, you know, it, it, it suffers obvious injury. Otherwise, it's not going to look right. Correct? So what they do is they just bypass all of this by just having the sheep run faster the closer you get to them. So it's impossible to hit them. Very clever. 
right? And a very, very simple thing to do. You could program that pretty quickly uh, in Unity if you wanted to. Machine learning, no. Um, but also the flocking behavior of the sheep is also pretty impressive. It uses probably a technique called Boyd's. Boyd's is a, um, a uh, I believe it's a, a, a Northeastern United States accent for birds, uh, kind of a New York accent for birds. Boyd's, you know, birds, Boyd's. Got some flock of Boyd's on the horizon, you know? Very fun to say. Um, anyway, this is actually a set of three AI, simple AI rules uh, that Flock allow of birds or fish or whatever you want. Yeah, that allow in a, a group of AI agents to kind of work together and create this really beautiful um, shape, right? This really beautiful emergent behavior. Um, I believe the ideas are you program in a simple avoidance algorithm, um, a simple kind of convergence algorithm, so that basically any given bird looks at the birds around them and wants to go in that shape. And then I forget the third one, but essentially it's three simple rules. And when you combine them, you get this beautiful organic flocking behavior. So anyway, I encourage you to watch this video. Uh, they'll go over the three rules and how to basically implement them. Um, but it, it, it really, it really is intriguing because you might wonder, okay, what other combination of simple, easy to implement rules could create incredible emergent surprising behavior like this? Are there other versions of Boyd's out there uh, that could uh, uh, really make your AI and your game super, super interesting. Um, so anyway, uh, da, 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 but okay. The real test would be getting multiple cars to try and corner the sheep because then the sheep might run into some issues and uh, uh, exhibit some very um, interesting behavior. Um, so massively multiplayer rollerball. These days, there are a lot of small, basic-seeming games that are really taking off and having an impact. If anyone has played Fall Guys recently, like there's nothing particularly interesting that hasn't been done before with what Fall, by, Fall Guys does. Uh, it, it kind of takes you know physics-based um, uh, third-person platforming genre and simply adds a bunch of players and then uh, gives us very smart level design that makes that very impactful. Um, here's another example of this. This is let's take rollerball and design levels for that is a lot millions of, of with players, that. right? Or, or thousands of players, or okay, hundreds, I think. So I keep scoping down. But this is a game called Marbles on Stream. I hope I can get the quality. That's not 720p. Are you kidding me? The spiral. And anyway, a huge lead. It's going to be Albatrice. Can he make it over the bubbles? Yes, he can. He's just made it past that with no problem whatsoever. And into the bin they go. Can he get a first Okay, second place there, the third, bin. fourth. Albatrice. Okay, oh, here yeah, comes the Peloton. Here comes everyone. Behind. Right, everyone, and there here they come. And there is going through the bin. It turns out that this is actually a camera that has a hitbox, so we can't... And then they all get to the goal, and, the and they get their ranking. The race, and, uh, and then at the yeah. last second, just Pretty like fun. Cycle. Like, if you go on to Twitch, um, when this came out, it was very popular, and I guarantee it made their development studio a good bit of change, which hopefully they're investing, reinvesting in a new game, some new technology, stuff like that. So anyway, um, you don't always have to come up with a super, super complex idea with many different moving parts. Um, sometimes it's simply taking simple ideas that exist but have not been combined yet and, and combining them, right? Roll a ball. It's been around forever, right? Since Marble Madness, right? Big, you know, 100 person lobbies. That has been around since at least the mid 2000s. Combine them together, you know, create some great level design that really makes these two concepts work together, and boom, there you go. Big game. Okay. Reminder, per the syllabus, if you have a regrade request you want to, to issue, you want us to take a look at your grade again, um, you need to let us know within a week, okay? One of the reasons is we quickly in this course get into grading other things, and we do not have time to go back and make that context switch uh, and, and go back and regrade things that, that um, haven't been relevant for a while, okay? So you need to do this. We will start ignoring regrade requests if you do not get them in within a week. So please do not delay. Um, unless something really serious comes up, do not delay. Get that done quickly, okay? Um, so do Wednesday. You've got P1 Research and P1 Alpha, okay? Um, and so please do not forget P1 Research. Get that in. That will help you a lot when it comes to uh, the P1 Gold assignment where you're doing new creative stuff on your own. Um, so 
normally during a normal semester we would do a uh, a fun little mini lecture where, where we all play super mario 3d world together and take a look at some of the so really interesting level design in that game however uh today we're gonna instead talk to you about a game series called mario party uh it's a very very interesting game series that does an incredible thing okay mario party solves an incredibly difficult challenge chat who's played mario party okay who's played mario party Anyone? Yeah? It is, a, it is really a fun series. Um, there are more than 10 games in the series, uh, and so it, it has worn on some people, but it's still a good, good time. So we're talking about player guidance when we talk about Mario Kart Party, okay? Ask, you, ask yourself, right? What, when it comes to a good tutorial, like what, what is a good tutorial, okay? What is a good tutorial meant to do, and what does a good, you know, how does a good tutorial implement that, right? Well, ask yourself this, chat. Do you think this is a good tutorial? Imagine this, okay? You've got a game you've been waiting for for a while, or you see a really cool-looking icon in the App Store. You download the game, and the first thing you're hit with is this, okay? You know, before you can play the game, here are four pages of scrollable, blocky text. you got to read about the game, right? Oh, oh, reading, am I right? Oh, psh, right? You do not want your player to have to read through a ton of material before even getting to the game. There are a few reasons why, right? Consider this. You might read about this object, this hat. What is this? A water skin, right? But you, don't, you might not use it for half an hour, okay? It might not be relevant for half an hour. So what is your brain going to do? It's just going to toss this information in one ear and out the other because your brain knows it's not important, right? And that's really not great, okay? That's not good. Too much text and at the wrong time, okay? Do not rely on your players to read the manual. Who has heard of this before? Is that in the manual? The manual! Nobody reads the manual! Did you read the manual? Nobody reads the manual. You read your manual. A manual? Reading's for yellow bellies. Let's go over there and not read. Like real men. Dark nabbit, nobody ever reads the manuals! Yep. No one ever reads the manual. These days, if you are giving a piece of entertainment to someone, um, they probably aren't going to want to immediately jump into a bunch of text, okay? Uh, and you also can't assume that they're going to read your directions. You can never assume that. So traits of a good tutorial, right? Informative. you got to get some sort of point across, okay? You're trying to teach the player something. Time efficient. You want to respect your player's time always. And ideally, you want to show, don't tell. When you show instead of tell, uh, people tend to remember that better, right? People tend to see the importance of something and, and remember it because it's important. If you just tell them, there are a million reasons why they might not really remember, okay, or care. And ideally, uh, yeah, skippable, right? Ideally, you want a tutorial to be just in time. Okay, so if you've ever heard of a just-in-time compiler, right, you know, you compile the code as you're about to run it, you're inside of the context in which that code will be run, right? Um, just-in-time tutorial is when you give players information at the exact moment that they need it, okay? You give people information at the moment it is very important so that the importance will be obvious to them and their brains will store it instead of throw it out, okay? Anyway, in multiplayer robust, this might be important for you this semester, maybe not. We're going to talk about a game in a little while called Kia Dark Lineage that does all these things very well, right? It tells you about, um, this is kind of cruel when I think about it in isolation, but the game gives you controls at the exact moment you need them and never before, okay? Um, and so anyway, here's a challenge for you, okay? Um, let's say... And this is not really authentic to this semester since we're all remote. But let's say your goal is to have a game at a showcase. And it needs to teach the players something. Okay? Now, this environment is noisy. It's crowded. It's distracting. And your game is multiplayer. Okay? How on earth are you going to give a tutorial in this setting? Okay? How are you going to make sure players don't miss the tutorial, miss the knowledge, get distracted, and then be confused when they're playing, okay? Well, this is the kind of problem, right? Also consider, 
when someone goes to a showcase like this, they'll play your game for five minutes and then they'll move on to another game and never come back. Okay? So you've got one shot for your players to understand the game so that they can play it and have a good time. Okay? Well, if you think about this kind of showcase-like distracting environment, this is exactly the situation that Hudson Soft and later ND Cube solved with Mario Party. Okay? Right? This is a series that has been around forever. And it's a series, right? The Mario Party series is all about playing mini games. Mario Party is a mini game collection where you might buy one Mario Party game, but that game has 50 to 70 different mini games inside of it. Okay? How on earth do you teach a player to play 50 different mini games? Right? I mean, that sounds like a nightmare. It's hard enough to get players to understand your one game that you're making. And you'll discover how hard this is very soon on your P2. How on earth do you teach players how to play 50 mini games? Okay, and not have them be confused. Because remember, they play one mini game and then they don't come back for a long time. So we got to get it right. How do we do that? Well, I want you to watch this video, okay? I'm going to show you one mini game and I want you to watch what the game does to teach you the game in only five seconds, okay? Watch what the game does, and then we'll watch the mini game, and then we'll talk about it, okay? Let's go. Okay, chat, what did you notice? Did you notice anything about how this minigame is presented? Chat, 30 seconds. What did you notice? The game developers do some kind of subtle things to help you understand the minigame before you even play it. Bingo. You got it, chat. You got it. And it's something that as a player, you might not, it might not jump out at you that the developers are doing this, right? But as a developer, right, when you're thinking as a developer and you're analyzing other games while creating your own, you say, oh, I see what they did. I see what they did, right? So here's the very first thing that the player sees, okay? This is the very first shot. This is, I believe, in film theory called an establishing shot. It gives you the setting, right? It gives you the arena. It shows you your player avatars that represent you, right? It shows you where you are and what the general kind of tone of this game is going to be. You can see fire in the background. It's dark. It's a little bit scary, right? It's intense, okay? The very next thing that happens is that you get this cool zoom in on your characters and Bowser falls in. How do your characters react to this, right? Your characters represent you and your characters show you how you should feel about Bowser being here, right? Ah, right? So you're shown that, okay, you should be worried. You should be avoiding this character right here. And its character design also shows you this, right? Bowser is designed to be kind of a scary character, even though he comes across as a bit derpy sometimes, right? Particularly in the Paper Mario series. That's beside the point, though, tangent, right? Um, then, right after your characters are shown to be afraid, right, you get to see a game mechanic, okay? Bowser spits a fireball during this cutscene straight at your characters, and your characters show off what their agency is, what their mechanics are, which is run away, okay? Right, then the game kind of pauses and just freezes, okay? This is a screen that will wait until every player has pressed the OK button, okay? As in... This is a screen where if you weren't paying attention or if you're confused or lost, right, you could hold up the entire game 
by just not pressing your OK button. OK, your two on the Wii boat in this case. OK, this is super valuable for the context in which Mario Party is played. Think about it. Mario Party tends to be played at parties, right? You know, in situations where lots of people are over, you know, when, you know, you might be distracted, there might be music going on, maybe you get hit by a ball or something and you, get, you turn your head, oop, you missed the intro, right? You missed the instructions. Well, with this screen, it's called a ready up screen. You can just hold up everything. You can force your, your, player, your uh, uh, fellow players to tell you what's going on and hold up the entire game until they've told you, right? So this is an extremely common thing in multiplayer kind of party style games. There's a very good chance you will implement something like this ready up screen, okay? Everyone ready up, readies up by pressing the two button and the game begins, right? At the very end, you get this right here is results screen, which is also very common uh, in both multiplayer and single player games. This results screen is meant to inform the player how they did, right? You see your character and you get to see how they would react to that, right? You know, Yoshi is not very happy up here because they all of these characters got hit at least three times, so they're all not very happy, okay? Imagine you're playing a chaotic game like this. At the end of it, you might not actually know how well you did. How well did you do compared to others, right? Um, so a result screen like this helps clarify before moving on how you did in the mini game, okay? So all these things, establish a setting, right? You know, show who your actors are. You got Bowser and then you got your player characters. Show off the game mechanics. Bowser can spit fire, you can run. Ready up, right? Then you get some gameplay and results. The amazing thing here is that all of these four things, they work, right? They work very effectively. They're subtle and they don't waste the player's time. It's not a bunch of text. It's over before you know it. It's only six seconds. It's extremely elegant. Um, and uh, the developers did a great job. Th these six seconds teach you how to play the minigame uh, before you have even, uh, even started playing. It's just fantastic. Um, the developers, though, also give you a little bit of information even before this. Before you start the, to play the game, uh, they will show you a video of the characters doing what, what the game wants you to do with a one-liner, a one-liner that tells you essentially what you should be doing, right? Swing fast, don't hit the bomb bombs. Um, we say in this course you want to avoid text, but let's be honest, if your eyes, the first time your eyes hit that text right there, you immediately read it, even if by accident, right? The moment you even see the text, you've already read it because it's a short and sweet one-liner. So the use of text here, even though they are using text, is very elegant because it's so minimal. Uh, if, you are, if you want to see an even more extreme example of using small, very small amounts of text to teach a game quickly, play the WarioWare series. That series uh, does, teaches the player even faster than this. Anyway, a good tutorial is going to mean a good showcase. Um, I, I want to show you that games have been doing this kind of thing for a long time. Kind of teaching players how to play without using text and in very brief kind of cutscene style uh, uh, approaches. Um, watch this. This is the uh, arcade machine of Pac-Man. Watch this. This is It's just booting up. So we get the characters here. <sighs> get a little point information. And look at this. Look at this right here. This little cutscene happening. Look at that. Did you see that? It was so fast that you might not even even seen it, right? It shows you the Pac-Man running away from the ghosts, and then it grabs a power pellet, turns around, and starts eating them for big-time points, right? Boom. There you go. Pac-Man uh, was doing it way earlier, way earlier than Mario Party. So that's an example of how you can try and teach players how to play your game um, without you know, resorting to sl super long tutorials, um, without resorting to anything that might bore the player. Okay. So what I want to do now is I want to give a lecture on guiding the player. I want to talk more about this essential uh, kind of element of game design, right? Guidance. Okay, so last time we talked about interesting decisions. Today we're going to be talking about guidance. Okay, chat, who remembers like the three big ways to put interesting decisions in your game? Three big things you're looking for to make your game's decisions interesting. 
What are they, chat? Can you remember? Can we crowdsource our way to victory here? I'll give you 20 seconds, chat. Okay, impactful, and we call that consequence, right? Boom, Foxkilla 170 has it, right? Add consequence, add surprise, and you want your decisions to be kind of temporal, right? Uh, Short-term, medium-term, and long-term decisions in your game, kind of in a longevity to your decisions, okay? And that will help out a lot, okay? Um, by the way, I love this photo right here. What is this, chat? What is this photo? Do you know? This is showing us the first level in its entirety of the original Super Mario Bros. game. This level right here does a very good job of guiding the player. This level design, what you see in front of you, has a ton of secret level design techniques, secret and subtle techniques that teach the player the game's various mechanics while they're playing. Okay, at the very end, I'll, I'll return to this and I'll kind of show them to you what they are. But it's just fantastic. I'll give you a hint. These pipes right here and how they progress is a very big part of teaching the player the jump mechanic. And a particular subtlety of how jump works in Super Mario Bros. Okay, I'll just give it away. Um, in Super Mario Bros., right, the previous game in the series was Donkey Kong. If you've played Donkey Kong, the arcade game, the jumps in that game were very stiff and very small. And they're all, they were very, um, there wasn't any customization to the jump. Like, no matter how long you held the button to jump, you'd always do the same jump, the same height. It was very stiff and it didn't feel good, okay? In Super Mario Bros., uh, Shigu, Shigeru Minamoto's team introduced the concept of variable jump height, where if you just tap the jump button, you'll go do this little hop, right? That's what everyone was used to. But if you hold the button, you'll do this, right? This huge jump. And if you're moving, you can do an even larger jump still. And so these pipes force the player to discover this mechanic, okay? To progress. They, they, in order to get further, you have to, okay, you can do a little hop to get first past the first jump, but then you have to hold it a bit to get past the second, and you have to hold the jump down the entire time to jump high enough to get to on top of this pipe right here. Okay, so the, the level design traps the player and forces them to experiment with the controls to discover on their own that there's variable jump height depending on how long they hold the jump button. It's just genius. It's incredible and it works extremely well. Okay, um, later on we'll be covering juice and game feel later on in the course. Okay, today we're going to be talking about guidance and you've already got a little taste of it with Mario Party and that level 1-1 one, one right there with the pipes. Okay, okay, so chat, I need your feedback. Okay, I need your feedback because I'm going to pitch you a video game. Okay, I want you to tell me, chat, how this video game sounds. Do you think it's going to be fun or not? Okay, here's the game. This game has a large, explorable world. Okay, what game do you think I'm, I'm thinking about? This game has a large, explorable world. It has many items to collect. Many more than other games of its time. It has aggressive enemies and some pretty intense chases. Okay, it has a finite amount of time. Okay, we got people saying, 